the vast difference. Growing a vascular access specialty team using data that demonstrates reduction in waste and variability with our Lee Steer. So Lee has been doing this for a long time. He is, uh, <laughs> I love to ab abbreviate this. Uh, he's been leading an IV team, really a vascular access specialty team at Hartford Hospital for 16 plus years. Uh, recent accomplishment was the completion of a study that resulted in implementation of all PI PIVs uh, being inserted on the inpatient units at Hartford Hospital using a vascular access RN and the five rights bundled. And you came up with that, Lee? We did. Yep. Yes. He awesome. is also on the Hospital Acquired Infection Committee, chair for of the HHC, that's his hospital, patient care clinical value team. Uh, Lee has spoken at multiple lo local and national infusion and vascular access conferences on CLABSI prevention, uh, CVAD occlusion management. And over the past year, he has been speaking about the success of PIV insertions using vascular access nurses and a bundled approach. And with that, we'll get to the show. Lee, thank you very much. And I'll let you start sharing your screen. That's beautiful. Lee's a working man. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I had to find a nice quiet hiding office to be able to do this presentation. Well, uh, you know, thank you all for, um, thank you, Ava, for having me back again um, to do this. It feels like I just did one just the other day in the same exact room. Um, so it's always great to be able to share with my colleagues uh, some of the work we're doing over here at Hartford Hospital and how we use Lean to do it and um, how we are collecting data that is really what uh, the C-suite folks are looking for um, and how that has helped us out. So let me see here. Oops, sorry, I got a little sensitive mouse. So there's me. I don't need to say much more about that um, only because uh, Blake did such a good job at it. I do have a few financial disclosures. I am the consultant for a few companies, as you can see there. And I am on a few companies, uh, speakers bureaus as well. Um, I would also like to a big shout out to Eloquist, of course, for sponsoring this event and sponsoring and, and allowing me to be here. So, so some of our learning objectives, I'm going to introduce lean thinking as it applies to vascular access and overcoming challenges faced by patients, clinicians and healthcare facilities. I'm going to show how uh, the VAS can collect and use data to assure they are viewed as a value added entity to their healthcare institution and outline the evidence evidence-based bundle and the clinical and financial results that, re that we captured that began the expansion of our vast team. Um, one of the things that I'm going to do very frequently throughout this presentation is refer back to the uh, newest uh, fusion therapy standard, standards of practice. They had a very nice section there. It's in Appendix A, and I really encourage all of you to read it. It's on infusion teams slash vascular, vascular access teams in acute care facilities. And I just wanna read part of it. It's a very quick part, but quote, attention to this goal, and that was to get VAS in acute care facilities, will reduce and or eliminate complications, lower costs, decrease length of stay, and reduce liability while promoting vascular preservation and greater pa patient satisfaction. I think we all knew that. Um, and it's, it's great to see that that appendix was added. And I think as we go through this presentation, you're going to really see how uh, my team and I are um, capturing certain data points that has really helped us um, expand to where we are today, which is quite impressive. So Hartford Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, for those of you who have never been to Hartford, I suggest you bypass and go to Boston or New York. It's much more exciting, but um, I am very proud uh, to be a resident of Connecticut. I just bought a home out in, uh, in the country a little ways. It's a little place called Hebron, Connecticut. Um, it's about a 35 minute drive to Hartford Hospital every day, but I did live in the city for quite some years. Um, love Hartford Hospital. We are just growing. When I first moved, when I first started here, you know, 16 plus years ago, we were just Hartford Hospital, but now we've turned into Hartford Healthcare and we're just a growing system. Um, we are a level one trauma center. You can see the bed size employees. We have the um, the state's only Lifestar ambulance service, um, plenty of ED visits every year and quite a few transitions from inpatient to outpatient. 
What I also like to show you here is our core values, integrity, caring, safety, and excellence. And I think as you see, you will see in this presentation, everything that my team has done um, is really embodied these uh, core values that our hospital has chosen. We are also a lean facility. Um, so we have uh, lean senseis, we have a whole lean division. Um, actually, I was just a part of a Kaizen this morning, the Kaizen kickoff, and that's uh, where you try to really look at a process, improve it, and try to look for opportunities to improve. Um, so it's, a, it's exciting, and I think what I want all of you to understand is that there is, if you're a lean facility, how important it is to be able to embrace that, because you can use it to help you get what you need. So what is lean um, um, and Six Sigma? Now, um, they're kind of one in the same, but as you can see here, this is the definition out, um, that I pulled from this website. You know, lean processes, the main emphasis is looking at cutting out unnecessary and wasteful steps. Um, and, and like I said earlier, in a lean organization, um, the, the job is for management to empower employees to define and then continuously refine process where the Six Sigma process is the essential goal of Six Sigma is to eliminate defects and waste thereby improving quality and efficiency. So I'll let you read the rest of that. Many of you might have known the PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act. That's pretty popular out there. Um, my team and I, when we decided to take on uh, our, uh, one of our projects, um, we used the DMAIC process to find, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And what I like about lean, again, hospitals looking for opportunities to eliminate waste and variability. Well, where is there a lot of waste and variability? That is in peripheral IV therapy. And I think all of you could agree with that. Um, and what we liked about the DMAIC process is it really helped us stay on track and stay focused. We didn't go from one step to the next until um, one was completed. And as uh, Blake was saying, he, uh, I think you mentioned your yellow belt. Um, not sure. sure how far that uh, goes to get you to be a black belt. But yes, um, he is not a karate master, although he may be. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm hoping not, because if so, just let me know so I can treat you very nicely. Um, so anyways, you can get uh, green belts, yellow belts, and black belts um, as a lean sensei. So talking about waste, uh, just recently, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement had a call to action, and that was to reduce waste in the U.S. healthcare system and return the cost savings to patients in the economy. Um, why did this happen? If you look at uh, the gross domestic product of um, any host, of, of healthcare and how much is spent in the United States in 2019, I know this slide says 2015, but I just looked up the figure today because I was curious. It was still at 17% of our gross domestic product is spent on healthcare. And look at the leap in 1970 was 6%. So we're, we're just rapidly climbing. And the most crazy part is if you break that down into cost per person, it's it, it the US healthcare system spends $10,966 per person. And we have the largest spend than any other country in the world. So it's a problem. Um, and as you can see that uh, Derek Foley, the president of and CEO of IHI, he said waste is endemic in healthcare and health system leaders and all who work in healthcare need to heed this call. Another non-value added waste, obviously, as you can see, is CLABSIS, $1.4 billion spent in 2018. So we have lots of opportunity in healthcare to really um, control cost. So let's just take one piece of healthcare, and that's peripheral IV catheter insertions. In 2018, the US census was 327 million. We sold more catheters, sorry, more catheters were sold to healthcare institutions than there are, pe than there are people in, in the United States. That to me is a staggering finger and it kind of just figure and it kind of just puts it into perspective. That's definitely not lean. And if you look at 350 million peripheral IVs and you times it by, I just took a kind of a, 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 a conservative price of $1.50. Just alone on the IV catheters, we're spending $525 million per year. If you look at it in terms of the average cost of a PIV insertion at $28, which is in the current literature, you take that by $350 million, that's $9.8 billion spent just on peripheral IV insertions. I like this picture that you see here. Um, 
just recently, well, I would say probably about two years ago, our hospital uh, signed a new contract with a peripheral IV company. So I had to go around and collect all the um, catheters that were in the hospital. And this is just all the catheters that were in Pixis machines, in boxes, you know, in closets. I think there were probably in some in the, in the nurses' lockers for all I know. It just, it, it amazed me how much waste. And thank God this is not, you know, all the IV catheters that we were inserting in people, but it just goes to show you, you know, there's just way too much waste in healthcare and we need to be doing so much better. One of the things that, uh, you know, I, I was, I meant to mention earlier is one, one of the things I really want everybody to get out of this presentation is how important it is to get data and to have key leadership in the initiatives that you're doing um, and to really make sure you're, you're speaking their language. Because I'll tell you, when you do understand their language and you speak it, they can't turn a blind eye to you. It's impossible. I, I'm, a very, I'm a quote guy. So, uh, you know, as Edward Deming said, in God we trust all others must bring data. And I'll never forget visiting a CEO in, in, in an Ohio hospital. And I walked into his office and sure enough, he had them in big, big letters. It, it, I think it wrapped around his whole hospital. And I, I know I knew I had seen it before, but I was just impressed that he had it there because, you know, the bottom line without data, you are just another person with an opinion. And, and for years, you know, as I was thinking and dreaming of um, growing my team, um, you know, I was that person who just had an opinion. And once I learned how to do some, you know, research, work with the IRB, start to, you know, looking at new products and, you know, talking with my colleagues and, and discussions with risk management and all infection control really got me to understand that, wow, okay, if I get data and I can prove the value of having a vascular access team at Hartford Hospital doing multiple things, I'm sure uh, their administration is going to listen. So um, I think the next slide goes right into where, where are we? So in the past, so in 2015, we had seven RNs and two LPNs. We were a PIC team we're doing multiple IVs as well. And those patients who needed IVs were waiting for hours because we just didn't have enough resources. 7.35 FTEs. Present state, because of what you're gonna see we have done here at Hartford Hospital in regards to data collection, I have been allowed to grow this team to 25 RNs. I just have, I just hired my last two um, and they are currently in orientation. We're very happy to have them. And actually I still have one open position. So I have the opportunity to have now 26 RNs on our team. Because of the growth of my team, this, just this past year, I was allowed to promote two, three of them. And I believe all three of them are currently listening to this presentation to a clinical nurse leader position. So we have now, a much bro bigger, robust team and uh, with, a, with a great group of leaders who I think are really gonna propel us into the, into the future. So it's, look at that, three times growth just in the past six years. And how did we do it? We collected data. So here's one of my first standards I wanted to you know, emphasize regarding vascular access services. It talks about organizing a team of clinicians dedicated exclusively to infusion and vascular access practices to provide the optimum method for infusion delivery in acute care facilities. And then PIVC insertion in adults by infusion slash vascular access specialists produce greater first attempt insertion success and lower rates of complications. So with that being said, one of the, um, projects that my team and I worked on was to uh, do a study on uh, looking at the value of a vascular access nurse putting in a peripheral IV using a bundled approach versus the generalist model. And the generalist model is your staff nurse using standard equipment and putting that IV in. And what that has resulted in for us is to be able to centralize our IV therapy services. And you can read that, that in the Java, um, I think it was 2019 fall edition. So let's talk a little bit about that. And why did we decide this? So one of the things my, my team and I do every single morning at 7 a.m. and also at 3 p.m. is we have a lean huddle. And so we stand in front of a board that has recognition. We go over the announcements and those are usually the hospital wide announcements. We then look at the daily playbook. How much staff do we have on? What are, what are, the, what are the things that need to get done today in terms of pick line insertions, dob hop tube placements, peripheral IV insertions, dressing changes, 
monoclonal antibiotic infusions, as well as our transfusion room. And we'll talk all, a little bit more about all that. Then we go over some metrics. Right now, our metrics are more focused on um, reducing incidental overtime. We look at our productivity index, but we look at a lot of different things. You know, how many central lines are we removing on a monthly basis? What's our collapse rates? And we discuss that. And the other thing that um, where, where we just became um, where this project developed was we did a um, we have a, what they call idea generation. So the idea generation is the staff's opportunity to say, well, why don't we do this? And so one of the ideas was around peripheral IV insertions because we used to replace our peripheral IVs routinely every 76 to nine, every 72 to 96 hours. We are currently clinically indicated, but during that process of defining this as a project moving forward, we didn't want to just go from routine to clinically indicated without studying it and without making sure that every IV we put in, we protect the patient from the five evils of IV therapy, the complications of infiltration, inadvertent removal, infection, occlusion, and phlebitis. So um, that's how we came up with our bundle. And the reason we wanted to, again, look at this project, because we know that peripheral IV catheters is the one most invasive procedure common to most hospitalized patients. And as, those, uh, and as healthcare providers, I always like to refer back to good old Flo, um, she stated the very first requirement in a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. So if we're using 350 million catheters per year, I would say that we are probably doing patients harm with vascular access devices. And we know that intravenous catheters can lead to septic shock. And then we know what happens if somebody gets a bloodstream infection that the mortality rate is 12 to 25%. Not, and it, so it just taxes the resources, it prolongs care, it results in patients dying. I love this picture. You know, I worked in ICU for five years and um, I, I've taken care of many patients who, who went into septic shock and, and all the pumps that you have to utilize with all the different channels, they end up on multiple different pressors, inotropes, um, you name it, they're on it. And then they, you know, you're dumping fluid in them because they're not able to store all that volume in their third in their intravascular space so they third space and they just they just blow up like a balloon um and then you know again many of them will pass so we really you know as healthcare providers need to remember what we're here for and that is to care for patients and so if we know that vascular access devices are a are a conduit to an infection we need to make sure that we take very good care of them from insertion to care afterwards, because again, as I stated, BSIs kill, and it will cost 12 to 25 percent of patients' lives if they are to get septic. What do we know about PIVC failure rates? So Robert Helm, a doctor, he published an article, "Accepted but Unacceptable." I highly, um, you know, encourage all of you to read it if you haven't already. A great, um, you know, retrospective review on. Um, or meta-analysis looking at randomized clinical trials of peripheral IVs, with the clinical literature showing peripheral IVs fail 46% of the time before their intended use is complete. Again, one of my quotes, most people spend more time and energy going around problems than trying to solve them. So don't we do that with peripheral IVs? What happens when a peripheral IV fails? Do we do a root cause analysis on it? No, we pull it out. We might put a warm soak on it if it's phlebitis. We might put cold if it's a presser. We might have to inject some antidote around that site as well to prevent further tissue necros necrosis and death. We know why peripheral IVs are failing. And look at what Robert Helms says. You know, it's a combination of two things, trauma and contamination. And that leads into the mode of um, catheter failure. So we know why they fail. We know that when we put an IV in the AC or we put one in the hand where it's moving, it will fail very quickly. Um, and that causes trauma to the patient. And here's more what Robert Helm said. A failed IV catheter means pain, dissatisfaction, prolongation of care, and venous depletion compounded by the need to treat minor and severe IV catheter failure related sequelae. And then again, how do we look at peripheral IV catheters failures? When a PIV safe fails, we as caregivers and healthcare institutions traditionally have accepted it as necessary additional work to be performed. 
is that fair to the patient? We should be able to put an IV in with all the technology and all the great medical devices, put an IV on the first stick and have it last till the end of that patient's therapy. I mean, look at these pictures, guys. Just it's, it's, it, it, or it, I, I, it makes me want to cry, to be honest with you. It just, it, I can't imagine the pain that these patients went through. And some of these patients are unable to get, let their no, needs met. So it just, you know, the, we start the IV, it starts to infiltrate and they just sit there while their arm blows up. Um, and then they have to deal with the pain after with that. So it's a problem. We know that. And let's look at patients, you know, one of the, this is a top, um, Colleen McSweeney, she's a national healthcare patient expert. She actually came to our hospital and did a presentation and she had done um, some studies on the top 10 fears of patients being um, hospitalized. Look at what number six was, needles. Nobody likes them. I love this little cartoon over here. You know, really, are you afraid of needles? The guy's got tattoos. He's got all the piercings in the world. But when it comes to having to get blood drawn or having a peripheral IV started, patients fear it. And this is this was the top 10 fears of patients who were going to be hospitalized. So it was like pre-hospitalization. Look at number nine, diagnosis and prognosis. Patients fear needles more than they are fear whether they're going to live or die. Now, of course, once their IV is successfully placed, then they start going down the list again of worrying about their diagnosis. So it, you know, it's a, it's a healthcare problem and it's affecting patients. This I just uh, learned about the ECRI, which is one of the most trusted voices in healthcare. They just published their top ten patient safety concerns for 2021. On that list, number nine, peripheral vascular harm. Great, you know, now that this is a public, you know, trusted voice in healthcare, I encourage all of you to get a hold of this and bring it to your, your um, upper administration, your CEOs and show it to them and say, and then bring some pictures, do anything, just make sure they understand we have a problem. And what I wanted to do, you know, these were all the recommendations. I just highlighted a couple of them, you know, set a target for peripheral IV placement with as few attempts as possible. How many of you have seen that patient who told, who has said, yeah, I, they stuck me 10 times before calling the, um, the, you know, IV team with the ultrasound. And again, avoiding anatomical complication zones. We know that's why catheters fail, but we continue to place them there. So, Getting back to our project of trying to get us to clinically indicated here at Hartford Hospital, we use Six Sigma methodology. Um, and again, we've talked about that earlier, the DMAIC process. We wanted to get um, peripheral IV inserted using a best practice bundle. So we had to define what our goal was. We wanted to see if we could get to one peripheral IV per patient stay. How did we measure it? We looked at published studies. We gathered um, consumption data of IV supplies. We looked at how long are patients waiting for IVs currently? What is the voice of our patients? Are they complaining about being stuck too many times? How is that affecting our length of stay? How much time are we spending training nurses who really are not gonna try to even master or practice the skill? Um, so those are the, some of the ways we measured. Then we analyzed all that data. And then to improve it, we decided we were going to do a study. And then we conducted it over 15 months. Um, we used dedicated nurses um, with data collection using an iPad app. Um, and then when the control process came, the control was really doing a presentation to our CNO, building a business case for a return on investment, which allowed us to get FTAs, FTEs reallocated to IV therapy. This is the bundle that we called, and many of you probably have already heard of it, PIV five rights. Um, P standing for the right proficiency, um, I standing for the right insertion, making sure we're using ultrasound, looking at the vein. We want 100% success with our insertions. V is the right vein and catheter, making sure that we always are looking at the forearm, mid forearm, because that acts as a great natural arm board, looking at the distance from um, the valves, so you have your vein to catheter ratio, making sure that we're not hogging up the whole vein space and not allowing for proper hemodilution. The right supplies was, uh, you know, uh, the, is, is the five. So a procedure kit for compliance. We used a longer catheter, 22 gauge, 1.75 inch, an anti-reflux needles connector, chlorhexidine um, impregnated dressing, 
and um, and uh, and, T and the, uh, obviously the CHD cleansing. And as you see with all our references here, these were all the studies that we reviewed in order to become um, and develop our best practice bundle called the PIV Five Rights. And the R stands for the right review and assessment. And that is making sure that we're out there flushing those catheters, making sure that they're not in infiltrated, they're not getting phlebitis and, and using um, um, the alcohol impregnated caps. So that's a little bit about the bundle. Um, and I wanna talk about just a couple quick little things um, that we use, especially come from the supply standpoint. So the right supplies and technology, we used, again, a pure, pure chlorhexidine impregnant boarded IV securement dressing. Now, for those of you who are clinically indicated, you know, I would encourage you to, to look at the products that you're using, because again, if you're going clinically indicated, you want to make sure if you're going to leave that catheter until the um, till it becomes either symptomatic or no longer needed, protect it. You know, we have to protect them from getting infected. What I liked about this dressing was not only was it impregnated with CH chlor pure chlorhexidine, but it had a bordered um, feature to it, which added in into the securement piece. But most what, what I, we really liked about this dressing was the fact that with all these bacteria out there, it had a log reduction the same pretty much from day one all the way to day seven. And it's a rapid onset of action because it doesn't have the gluconate in it. It literally hits the skin and, and it immediately starts killing bacteria. Where with um, chlorhexidine gluconate, you need to, um, you need to uh, have some heat and moisture to be able to um, break down that gluconate so that the C CHG starts to work effectively. When it comes to uh, needleless connectors, we, um, we decided to go with the anti-reflux needleless connector. Um, what, what did we like about it? Well, we had great success with it in reducing our TPA, which you're gonna hear about in a little bit, um, by 50%. So we knew that it was obviously preventing intraluminal uh, clot formation. Um, there's no clamping sequence, which was a, a big win, clear, straight fluid pathway, and had a nice uh, 300 degree compressible seal. Um, just recently in the INS standards, they have um, actually put some language in there about the anti-reflux needles connector. They actually added it as another classification for needles connectors because before it was always positive, negative, or neutral. So now we have this one. And it really, um, it talks about... Um, in this, that there's an in vitro study that was done that really looks at the amount of blood reflux with all the various needleless connectors out there. And it, it's pretty eye-opening when you look at it because, you know, we know that when you put a piece of polyurethane or silicone into the blood, blood proteins immediately start to adhere to that catheter surface. So what happens is if you get that blood reflux, it's going to do the same thing in that. And regardless of how well you flush, no matter what, how well the pulsatile flushing occurs, you're not going to clear that catheter 100%. So it is important to make sure that we keep the blood out of the tip of our catheter. Um, and it, there's so many different ways that blood unintentionally refluxes from mechanical, meaning, you know, inadequate um, clamping, syringe disconnection sequence, but there's also many things that happen with patients, coughing, sneezing, um, all those types of things that can also lead to unintentional blood reflux. So this was the success of our study. It took us 15 months. We had enrolled about, um, you know, just over 200 patients. As you can see, our first stick success rate was 96% compared to the national average of 33%. We weren't unable to measure first stick success rate in group one because it wasn't adequately documented. Our catheters, 89% lasted from beginning to end of therapy, 15% on the control group. You can see our dwell time was much better with our upper dwell limit of 333 hours compared to 111, our complication rate was 11% uh, versus 40% group one. And then we put a cost savings to this, um, which resulted in uh, just over $3,000 per bed. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. But first we're gonna do another poll question so I can have a drink of water. Thank you, Blake. I love it. <laughs> well, let me take it from here. That was timely for you, Lee. Yes, it was perfect. I was getting very dry. How many of you know your cost per bed of IV therapy? Oh, this is a great question. It's one of my favorites. I know, I've heard you speak one other time. I can't remember where. 
<laughs> Probably. Maybe here. <laughs> oh, this is great. Yeah, it's looking good. Guys, so, oh, I know we so much three, appreciate you. I know my three clinical nurse leaders are listening right now, so I'm sure they're picking yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll take them right out of the mix here once we get our final number. Fair enough. Awesome. Well, let's take a look now. at the results here. <laughs> wow, look at that. <clears throat> Am I surprised? Not That's a hard no. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that 14 of you well, I'm going to say 11 because my three clinical nurse leaders are listening right now, but I'm surprised that even 11 of you know your cost per pet for IV therapy because I will tell you, you, I bet if you went back and you quizzed your CNO or your CFO, they won't have a clue. Even your CEO will not understand the cost per bed for IV therapy. So, and, and do a literature search. You're not going to find it anywhere as well. So one of the things once we were done with our study is we wanted to try to figure out how we could put a cost per bed per IV therapy to our results. Um, and that would allow us to be able to give my CNO a presentation showing the value of a vascular access team. And if they were to reallocate FTEs to us, how, how good of a job we could do. So without going crazy into this, what we did is we looked at catheter usage on the patients we would be putting the IV into. We looked at the, the number of catheters sold in a particular year based on, and then we took a percentage of that based on the percentage of admits for 2018. And these are the two numbers that we came up with, 148,000 catheters, three 33,486 admits. If you divide that number into the 148, you come up with a catheters per patient visit of 4.4. Then we took the nurses hours spent putting in 148,000 catheters. Now the average time is about 20 minutes. Um, that's what the literature says. And I will say that we validated that. It is a 10 step process from the moment that the nurse identifies that the catheter has failed to the time that that nurse is done with documentation. It is about 20 minutes. So nurses hours spent 49,400, which equates to 23.75 FTEs. The labor of 16.17 is 20 minutes of an RN's time. And I got that figure off of glassdoor.com. If you ever want to go on that site, you can plug in to make sure that your um, state is paying you, your hospital is paying you enough based on, based on what nurses are getting paid in that state. Um, the supply of cost was 1180. So the cost per IV was 27.97. And if you times that by 148,000, you come up with a cost of $4.1 million. Divide that number by 867 beds, we get a figure of $4,800. Taking the results of our study of 89% success rate, that results in a 1.1 catheter visit. So um, again, how we took that, you can see that the number of catheters dropped significantly um, based on the results of the study, and that's the number that we came up with. Our nursing hours were 12,278, resulting in a 5.9 FTE equivalent. Labor went up. RNs in uh, Connecticut who put in our, who are vascular access experts get paid a little bit more. Look at this, our cost of supplies went up as well. We were gonna use the best of class of medical devices that we felt would create the best bundle. So our cost per IV went up to $33. Times that by 36,000 catheters, you get $1.2 million spent. Divide that by 867 and that results in your 1405 per bed. So a savings of $3,300 and change. I think this is a very conservative number guys because what, what the, this only looked at one aspect of if we took over IV therapy, didn't look at patient satisfaction, which we're gonna talk about later, reduce in peripheral IV, um, infections, um, le decreasing length of stay, decreasing the delays in IV therapy. The, the cost, we could just keep going on and on and on, but we had to come up with a figure, why? Because that's what your CNO and your CNO, CFO wanna see. How are you going to save them money? One of the best parts of this, we didn't have to increase the nursing budget because I said to my CNO and CFO, if we're going to save you all these nursing hours, why don't you just reallocate some of the FTEs of these departments to IV therapy? And that was what was done. And we have about 18 departments that we can just shave off a little bit here and there 
and reallocate it over to us. And that's what we did. So it was a win in both directions. Not only were we going to save money and increase patient satisfaction, but we were also going to not increase the overall nursing budget. So again, how much do we really think we saved with this initiative? I can't put a dollar amount to much of it. You can look at the rec costs. Yeah, fewer restarts, cost savings, no more time training bedside RNs, but looking out of the indirect costs of CLABSI prevention, treating fewer IV complications, again, patient satisfaction, patient satisfaction affects reimbursement. Length of stay impact, you know, if a patient misses a dose of antibiotics, how does that affect that patient's length of stay? So uh, as I always th say, pictures are worth a thousand words. And um, this is one of the things that I think really convinced my CNO um, and CFO. They both looked at these pictures and said, oh my God, because what do you see? Waste, variability, and defects. Blood in the tubing, different dressings, different securements, some dressings missing. There is nothing consistent in these pictures besides maybe the green alcohol impregnated caps. And this is what we see today, okay? It's current state, standard work, PIV5 rights, and an evidence-based back, evidence-based practice bundle with all insertion. These are all forearm placed, great securement. We are protecting our catheters and they are lasting. So remember earlier, I talked about uh, the peripheral IV ca catheter failure rate of 46%. We just completed a 300, uh, or I was the principal investigator of a 300 patient study. Um, and you're actually gonna be able to see the results of the study at AVA this year, because it was a, one of the topics accepted for presentation. So this was a pretty big study looking at um, using a novel uh, device to prevent uh, peripheral IV catheter dislodgements. Um, and they felt that this company, if, if, this pro, if this study worked, that they'd also be decreasing overall failure rates because we all know that when a patient goes yanks on their catheter, what else happens? That catheter micro pistons moves back and forth causing um, inflammation and irritation to the vessel wall which will lead to catheter failure. So this actually slide, and it was so great because I was on with um, my CEO, my CFO, um, and a bunch of other high, um, uh, higher figures in the healthcare system and the company that uh, sponsored the study, study put this slide up. So it said the vast team failure rate today, right now, based on the control group was 26.5%. So we've already cut the failure rate by half. Um, and I got to change my screen a little bit just so I can read this, but they wrote this, Hartford Hospital has clearly bought into the idea of investing in their vascular access team and in quality vascular access devices, which is shown by the hospital's world-class results, better results, lower costs. So we're very happy about that. And we didn't really know that, but what a great ability to have a study that was done to outline that. So um, I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you at AVA this year in person and, and please, uh, I, I would hopefully now get to see this, um, the results of the study that we conducted. Um, so one of the, uh, the other things that we were able to prove is that the cur courtesy of the person who started the IV has increased since we took over. Now, I, I, I wanted to make sure I highlighted this section during, uh, because that was when COVID-19 hit um, initially. And what had happened is, our team had to switch from what they do standard work today to what they to back to what we used to do. So what does that mean? So when we took over all insertions on the inpatient units, we would literally try to see every patient admitted to the units within 24 hours, assess their site, assess their veins, write a note if necessary, and try to make sure that that patient had the right device. If it was in the AC or hand, put in the ED, we would pull it out and put it in the mid forearm. During COVID-19, because there was such a PPE crisis and issue and shortage, we had to go back to the old way of waiting for the staff to call us when the peripheral IV catheter failed. So we do definitely um, feel that there was a reduction in our pay, our, the courtesy of person who started the IV because of that reason. Because then once you saw that COVID started to plateau during the first wave, our, uh, page, our satisfaction scores went way up again. Notice how it, um, this question is just about the courtesy of the person starting the IV. It's not about the skill. 
So, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because I do think that no matter what, it is also about the skill, but, you know, you can have the best nurse in there um, doing the best job, but if they don't have a smile on their face, I don't think uh, the patient's going to very much uh, give them the highest rating. So, unfortunately, uh, this question has gone away. Um, uh, our hospital decided that they, they wanted to switch what they asked uh, Press Ganey to um, inquire about, but at least we got this before that um, time has occurred. One of the other things, again, more data collection so that we can prove our worth. Uh, we did a staff survey. Uh, the survey was sent to three units. Um, so 129 nurses responded, which gave us a 57% completion rate. We sent it to a medical, a cardiology, and a step-down unit. The first question was, do you believe that having the IV team in place has saved you time? 86% of them said yes. And then 87% said they took that extra time and are spending more time with their patients. And then we asked them, how does having the IV team putting all the IVs in impact your daily role and responsibilities? 54% said they have fewer pump alarms. It is awfully quiet on these units compared to what it used to be. I used to hear pump alarms all the time. I'll go in a unit sometimes and not hear one. 61% stated they're, um, they don't have to have patients. 61% have fewer IV restarts needed. 77% fewer unplanned dressing changes, 78% fewer IV complications, and 81% fewer patient complaints. What a great way to try to, again, show your worth. A little simple um, survey monkey survey that we sent to the staff to ask them. And this is a, a, something that we've decided as a leadership we're probably gonna um, repeat on a quarterly basis so we can continue to see how we are doing. And it's a great way to measure that. All right, so one of the other th things that we've done, again, you know, collecting data is we looked at our Alta Place reduction for declotting central lines. Um, we, this is again, where the anti-reflux needles connector has come into play. Um, we did a study back and we published the results of that. Um, and I believe that was in 2018, Java edition, but it talks about a lot about how we identified the use of Alta Place as a problem, a potential saving opportunity, and, um, and how we created this um, algorithm that helps the staff um, follow a certain sequence of steps when going to assess whether a line is needed or whether the catheter is malfunctioning. Out of place, costing anywhere from six, 65, the price has probably gone up to, um, to probably $75, $80 per milligram, I'll tell you, those dollars add up very quickly. So as you can see, um, in 2014, our baseline usage per month was 119 milligrams of TPA. Um, and as you can see with the, with the study that we've done, um, with the introduction of the anti-reflux needles connector, we also introduced the algorithm and we took over the process of ordering out to place. So the, the nurses on the unit no longer can do it. They could, but they, um, they're in our order set, we have it so that they have to click two buttons. One is um, um, making sure that the IV team comes evaluate before Alta Place is ordered. And as you can see, we have sustained over the last five years, a nice reduction in our Alta Place usage of greater than 50%. We are actually, um, oh, I think actually, um, Judy, you might like this, that the manuscript is actually done um, for our five-year sustainability with, uh, uh, with Alta Place reduction that we're hoping to get published soon. I do love that. We also had a nice reduction in cost. Um, as you can see, we were spending about $22,820. We were also a facility that loved to use heparin flushing. So not only did we you know, bring in a better, needle, better class of needles connectors, um, we've reduced our, t our out to place consumption as well as heparin. And as you can see, the savings is pretty substantial. And because we're sustaining this, again, these are why we create graphs like this so that I can make sure that if um, my CNO asks, what are you doing? Here it is. Here's all the good stuff that we're managing to um, help um, create the, a better fiscally um, responsibility facility. And why is this important? Again, always going back to the patient. Um, studies have been done. You know, there was one done um, in, at Boston Medical Center for they retrospectively looked at 3,720 three patients with PICC lines and determined that occluded catheters requiring TPA 
or alteplase had a 3.59 times greater risk of developing eclapsy. Makes sense, you know, you think about it, your catheter's clogged with, with, um, with glucose and electrolytes, um, blood, that is a medium for bacterial growth. So the smallest little colony of uh, Staphylococcus aureus or, or, or any other uh, micro, micro bacterial organism will uh, find that. And that is like a Petri dish to them. So then you go break it up and uh, sure enough, some of that's gonna end up in the bloodstream. Back to uh, the Journal of Nursing. What was this one? Establish the infusion team slash vascular exit team as a revenue and cost center and acute care facilities allowing the team to track and analyze services provided and document financial contributions to the organization, showing revenue to offset costs. So we've already shown you some of that. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit more. So this is the projected increase in billings for CPT code 36,000. So what I have found um, in talking with many colleagues is that there is, um, most hospitals have put in the art of IV insertions and the cost of that into a bundled um, bed cost, okay? Because this hospital here has always had an IV team, we were always able to bill for that separately. And as you can see, since we've taken over and done all, doing all the IV insertions, the revenue that we're bringing into the hospital is increasing. Um, in October 1st, 2019, we brought in just over 6 million. We're up to 7.5 million in uh, July of 2019. And again, I apologize, but I got to bend, bend my screen here for a second. And if you look at the bottom, our total bill, billable services um, for fiscal year um, 2020 was $16 million. And looking at this year, fiscal year 2021, currently at 8, 000, 8 million, and I annualized that. So we're looking at, again, a, a nice budget increase from 2020 to 2021 of um, $3 million. So it is very important to try to show that you're capturing revenue. Um, and that's really, you know, working with your CFO and your CNO to break that out of your um, overall bed costs. All right, what else are we doing? We decided that um, we were going to take over some Dabha feeding tube insertion. We wanted to centralize that. That got us more FTEs. Um, and we use uh, what they call uh, uh, some real, tra real tracing technology. And, and we did this because we started to, um, it was, this was back in 2014 that we started this conversation. But with this real track um, tracing technology, of the Dabaha feeding tubes going in, we had determined that a lot of PIC teams were taking this art over because of the familiarity with um, real tracing technology using um, with PIC insertions. So since we took over in 2015, we put in, a pro we've probably approximately put in about 9,000 tubes inserted. We have had two lung cannulations with a pneumothorax, but if you do the percentage, it comes out to 0 0.00, zero two percent where the national average with blind placement is two percent um so two percent of nine thousand is 180 25 percent of those patients would develop a pneumothorax which would have been 25 so i think uh com you know 25 compared to two or, or vice versa is is obviously much better and obviously you know any iatrogenic event that occurs meaning any complication that a hospital um, causes a patient, you're not going to get reimbursed for that anymore. So um, this was another a great way of us demonstrating that we will reduce waste and variability and do better things for our patients. We also, uh, back in maybe 2017, I want to say, we um, opened up an outpatient blood and blood transfusion center. Um, and why did we do this? Because what it was going to do is free up beds and any um, new admit. Uh, and when you free up a bed, and a new admit can get in there, that is just revenue for the hospital. Um, and here again is our monthly numbers that we collect. Um, this was just for March. It was one of the better months. I think we had 124 blood, blood product and iron infusions. This was a great initiative that we started because what happens is outpatient blood transfusions would get booked a bed the day before they would wait at home for a phone call from the hospital saying a bed is open, please report to here. The patient would go to the, into that bed, 
the nurse would be caring for four or five other patients. Then they'd have to take on this patient. So they weren't the biggest priority. This patient would be sitting in this bed all day long. They'd bring their computers, they'd bring food because they knew they were going to be there forever. And also that held up a potential bed for a patient in the ED. Now we have this room. They literally come in. If they're getting two units, it's an average of anywhere from five to six hours, sometimes a little bit less. These patients come in and they're out the door. And you got to remember, these are patients that have lives. They're working. They have families. So to you know be able to come in and get out fast is really a benefit for them and, and was high, viewed as a great initiative by our hospital administration. All right, more on the journals of infusion nursing. Teams reduce the healthcare acquired complications associated with CVADs, including pneumothorax, arterial punction, and catheter associated infections. So, what are we doing with this one? So, we uh, took a, we do central line necessity rounds. And again, um, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, we print up a brand new list of all the central lines in the hospital and we go see them. Um, and we look at um, whether they're clean, dry, and intact, but most importantly, we look at if they're necessary. We know that the longer a catheter stays in, we just keep increasing our risk of that patient getting an infection. So what do we do? We track the number of patients that we see. We track the number of um, lines that we have advocated and removed. And if you can see in February, we got 25 removed. And in March, we got um, a total of 34 removed. Personally, I think that's a little bit too high of a number because what it does is show me is that my team is really looking at line necessity a lot better than uh, floor nurses are at this point in time. So, and, and we do, we are struggling with collapses as I think a lot of healthcare institutions are, and it's very, mac very multifactorial. But as I tell my staff all the time, we can control what we can control and our control is doing what we're doing, making sure that we're collecting the data because this is what administrators want to see. And also making sure that we're doing um, on, on spot real time education when we see something going wrong. This is our newest initiative. We um, are currently working on um, developing an outpatient parenteral antibiotic therapy unit. Again, what does that do? It opens up beds for new admits and it prevents admissions and direct admissions to uh, hospital beds. So this is our preliminary results. We started this back in October. I was able to get approved for another 1.4 FTEs to our vast budget to help this. But this is uh, all done through a red cap survey that we have. And what, what are we looking at? You know, we look at the patient. We look at how many days saved. Guys, I can't stress enough. When you go to a hospital administrator and say, tell them you saved 129 days, they drool. They love it. And then if you look at the um, outpatient revenue that we're bringing in, just on these 10 patients, we brought in $25,800. This is definitely going to increase. We're talking about making it its own separate unit with its own separate cost center number, own separate um, budget for FTE. So this is growing. It's growing fast. We've actually prevented some patients um, from even being a direct admit to the hospital where the ID doctor started them on PO antibiotics until we could get them in to put a PICC line in as an outpatient and then have them come daily for their antibiotics in our, in our unit. A lot of these patients too are those complicated patients that normally have to stay in the hospital their whole stay because they're a high risk um, IV drug user. Um, so we, we, you know, the, some of these patients we've been able to get out of the hospital. They come in, we put in a, an IV on, you know, each time they come in to finish their antibiotics. So another great initiative that we started. And again, another way to um, show value and growth of a team. Our last initiative we're going to talk about is gum mastic to prevent unplanned dressing changes. So yes, lean, lean, again, eliminating waste how can you eliminate waste using gum, gum mastic? You, um, it, it's getting rid of unplanned dressing changes. Um, so again, when we did the trial on this, you're gonna see those results. We wanted to you know, increase our dressing adherence, um, prevent inadvertent removals and prevent phlebitis from, micro, from catheters that are micro pistoning. So when we trialed this product, um, we did it in a, one of our cardiac ICUs. And I specifically had taken this unit because of those patients are sitting in their beds, waiting for their open hearts. And they've got a gigantic cortis in their IJ with a Swan-Gans catheter. 
very difficult um, catheter to dress. So if you look on our chart here, so what we had done is we did a pre and a post evaluation of dressings on this unit. We did it for four weeks. Um, and as you can see, based on the results of our, of our auditing, that we had an average non-intact dressing rate of 77%. We then had like a two week washout period and we did a lot of education. And I will tell you, um, our, our, our gum mastic rep was great and really helped me to create, to get a lot of this data together. And um, we just did a whole house audit, which I'll show you the results of that in a few minutes um, as well. And she, she was a uh, spectacular helping with that. Um, so that we had that two week washout period, we did a lot of education and then we introduced gum mastic um, and we required it for all central venous catheter dressings. And if you look at the results, we had um, a 30, 6% average non intact dressings. But I think what's most important to show here is that before we had partially detached dressings at 14%, post 0%, totally detached 2%, post 0%. So what we had found was that just some of the edges were lifting and all it required was just a little bit more education. You know, when you're putting in a line or you're doing a dressing change, when you're trying to figure out where you're gonna create that square, sometimes you probably cut it a little bit um, too close um, and come in too tight. So you're not actually securing that, that edge and preventing it from lifting. So um, we've done a lot, you know, a lot more education. Now that uh, vendors are allowed back in the healthcare facilities, I definitely plan on using our rep to come back in and, and do some more education to staff. But I'll tell you, uh, we just did a, a, a new um, audit, um, which I was pretty impressed with the, with the results. And I'll tell you why it took so long to do it. But think of all the cost savings in nursing time, supplies, and CLABSI prevention. So again, when you're looking at doing, trying to get something into your hospital, you really have to understand that, you know, yes, bringing something like this in costs money. That's hard cost to, a, to somebody who deals with dollars every single day. And that's where you have to then say to people, okay, guys, but think about it. We prevent one CLABSI, that's $48,000. Think about all the dressing changes that we're gonna avoid, saving nursing time and supplies. So you save in just so many categories and you just have to make sure that you highlight that. One of the greatest things that I, I remember was walking into the ICU and it was maybe week, might've been week one um, after we had instituted gum mastic. And I had a nurse literally walk right up to me and stand right in front of my face and say, we love this product. They did. I, I didn't even think even I mentioned the product. They just said they loved it. And the reason why is because they were saying we were changing dressings every single day. Okay. I was sort of stunned by that. Um, and, uh, but it's true. So um, it's really become a, a great device recently when we did the full house audit. Uh, I was constantly going up to nurses, asking them what they thought about it. And they just were, you know, they were, they love it because it's really saving them time. This was a, 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 the whole house audit that we just got through doing um, very recently, just in the last few weeks. Um, and the reason I took so long to do this, um, you know, one of the things when you bring in a product, I believe in making sure that you add it to whatever kit the staff are gonna use. That's how you get your compliance above a 90%. If you have freestanding gum mastic vials hanging around the units, the staff are gonna go in with their dressing change kit and they're gonna open it up. They're gonna put their sterile you know, gloves on after they've removed the old dressing. Then they're gonna go, oh, damn, I forgot the vial. So you know, it's very important that when you introduce something, you put it in the kit. Well, it took a very long time to get it into the kits. Um, a lot of that had to do again with COVID and, and supply shortages. So um, we just recently got it into our, our central venous catheter dressing change kits. And once I knew that we had you know, gotten, we were starting to see those dressings in, in house, that's when we decided that we would go do another to a whole house audit and we did it. Um, and as you can see, the results were, were much better. Um, than um, what I expected. Um, the dressings look great. But one of the things that we did find was that 15.1% uh, of the dressings were either wet or bleeding. Um, and a lot of that was old blood underneath. And we know that this creates a medium for bacteria growth. So we have some education we need to do. 
Um, we did see a, a total of 126 lines um, and 79.4% uh, of those were fully intact. Um, 15.9% had the edges lifting or reinforced. One of the things that we are struggling with here at, at Hartford Hospital, and, and some of you may identify with this, is um, IJ placements. Um, and the reason being is because ultrasound has become the uh, mainstay with all central venous catheter insertions. Why? Because it's the safe thing to do for patient care. One of the problems, though, is that, uh, you know, it's really pushing and getting us away from the subclavian where we know it's a much cleaner and better spot to have a central line inserted. So again, trying to, you know, make sure that that dressing is going to stay really nice and intact on the IJ is difficult, especially when you have um, various providers inserting it and not everybody is trying to shoot as low as they can um, in the neck to, so that we can have a good um, um, surface area to get that dressing to stay um, on as, as it should. But I will say that, you know, despite that, and we are working on, um, you know, multiple avenues to try to get our collapse rates down. And that's one of our initiatives is to get doctors to become more comfortable using ultrasound for insertion into the axillary vein versus the subclavian. Um, you know, uh, definitely having um, gum mastic in the kits um, is definitely helping us um, with those unplanned dressing changes. Uh, let's see, next slide. Um, again, this is just a graph showing you um, the number of patients that we've seen, how many were intact, um, much less with the partial detachments, and we didn't have any that were completely detached at all. So that was great to see. All right, and very happy that the uh, Journal of um, Fusion Nursing in the standards, the eighth edition, they did add that in. The standard is, you know, talks here about making sure that, um, you know, dressing integrity once it becomes comp compromised, and that could be as simple as lifting or detached on any border edge, is to make sure that we get in there and change that dressing. And then the practice recommendation is to evaluate the beneficial use of Ben. Gum mastic look at the adhesive on adult patients when enhanced adhesion it is needed. We do them on all central venous catheters, not just ones that are wet or bleeding. The benefits uh, far outweigh any cost increase that it may cost to add it um, as part of that bundle. I am excited to say, and I know um, this has taken a little bit longer than I thought, um, but we are going to um, be doing further evaluation of gum mastic on peripheral IVs. Uh, right now, um, a, a protocol is being um, revised a little bit, but we're going to be doing a randomized controlled clinical trial on PIV insertions. Um, the, we've powered it that we only are going to need 106 patients, um, 53 for the control, 53 for the experiment. The experiment group, we're going to use the exact same bundle we used that we talked about earlier. We're just going to add gum mastic to the bundle. And um, the control group is, again, going to be using um, standard of care kind of equipment, the one-inch catheter, neutral needleless connector, uh, non-border transparent dressing, and no ultrasound usage. So this should be uh, pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to getting it rolling. Um, just takes a little bit of time uh, more and a little bit of patience. All right. Of my slides on it. Oh, there we go. So, so um, you know, again, we've done a lot, and a lot of it is through data collection. I can't say enough about it. You know, if 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 you're not collecting data, it's you're just again another person with an opinion. It's hard to increase your team size if you can't speak the language that um, CNOs and CFOs are looking for. So, um, in 2018, every year we have a um, an award ceremony. Uh, clinical team of the year and clinical support team of the year. 2018, we applied. We got. Um, we were one of the three runners up. Um, in 2019, we were the chosen clinical team of the year. Very excited. Um, we have our CFO, our CNO, sorry, on the left hand side. Our CFO is on the right. Um, Great recognition, um, lots of teams apply. So we were one out of, um, I wanna 
somewhere around a 20 teams that were chosen. Um, and what I like about it is uh, they actually get volunteers from the community setting to be the judges. So it's a very non-biased um, uh, award ceremony. We've also uh, done a few uh, awards on um, what they call full circle awards for some of the smaller initiatives that we're doing. So I do try to make sure that I apply for any type of recognition that's out there to keep us on the radar as a team that's really helping out patient care and supporting the hospital's uh, mission and vision. Lastly, uh, the Journal of Nurse Infusion Nursing talks about, um, you know, what, what's the statement, encourage and support members of the team to obtain and maintain an internationally recognized board certification. So um, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for listening and participating, and um, I'd love to take a few moments to hear people's thoughts, comments, answer some questions, and go from there.